Have any of you seen the Wounded Warrior um, commercials that have been on TV recently? Yes. Uh, they're very moving, aren't they? Um, in fact, um, to think of what these men and women are suffering as they come back. Um, and and it's, in some ways, the, it seems like the wounds are worse than they've been in previous wars, and some of that's because we're able to, to do things medically to keep people alive, so that then they come back, um, sometimes losing many, many body parts and all. And one, one of the commercials uh, is a wife who's talking about what it means to be a part of the Wounded Warrior Project and, and how lonely it has been for her, for her even as the wife, and for how lonely it has been for her husband. And you see this man, and he's, he's completely broken down physically. He cannot see. Uh, he's barely able to walk and stuff like that. And, and she makes that comment. She says, seeing Corey, her husband, with other wounded warriors was so encouraging. And they're actually, they show them out as they're doing, uh, I believe it was a I guess you would call it a run, but most of them were on various types of vehicles that they were somehow peddling. She says, the feeling of being alone was the hardest thing I've experienced. The feeling of being alone. I thought back over um, past years, there was this really well-known um, comedy, if you want to call it that, called Cheers. Remember the slogan that they used to, 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 to use for that? A place where everybody knows your name. And in fact, if you think about it, several of the, the programs that we have today are somehow related to that kind of concept of connecting with other people. And now, they've kind of broadened the whole idea of, of family. But you think about it. There's another one that's no longer on, although the, the shows continue to air. Friends. What was it that? About all these co collegiate age friends as they were growing up and taking care of one another and sometimes loving and falling in love with each other, all those things. Uh, uh, there's the, the office, incidentally. Uh, what's that about? Again, all kinds of relational things going on there. Uh, even, even one of Debbie's favorite shows, The Good Wife. Don't watch it. It's gotten too sexy. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. <laughs> Guys, fast forward through sexy things. How do you know when it ends? Okay, never mind. Okay. But, but you see, even, even the good wife is about all these kind of relational things going on. George Gallup said, Americans are among the loneliest people in the world. M. Scott Peck said, trapped in our tradition of rugged individualism, we are an extraordinarily lonely people. So lonely, in fact, that many cannot acknowledge their loneliness to themselves, much less to others. Joel Comiskey in his book, The Relational Disciple, says transformation takes place in community. God is not a lone ranger. He exists in community. Sunday morning is not community time. Oh, I know, we try to be friendly with each other, right? Virgil tries to greet everybody and have a you know, conversation with you. But, and and there's, a, there's a certain friendliness that, that I hope we do have here because this is kind of where we get that first impression opportunity for people. Are you going to be accepted the way you are or are you going to be rejected? And some of that happens literally the way you find yourself out there in that parking lot or as you walk in the door. Somebody walks up to you and says, why are you here? You're probably not going to feel real welcome. Somebody tells you, you're sitting in my seat, or they just give you that glare. You moved. You're supposed to sit in that side of the room, right? <laughs> you have a different spot here. Yeah. I mean, there's things that we can do that can really make people feel uncomfortable, right? Some of us are rather abrasive. Have you ever noticed that? <laughs> well, obviously, you're not one of them, but, but some of us are somewhat abrasive. Some of us wait for other people to come and greet us, and we feel sad and hurt and troubled when no one came, and we wonder why, and, and we don't even think about the fact that the five people sitting right around us are all guests, and we've been here for 20 years, and we're the one who should be reaching out, but wondering, why is that person come, not call, talking to me? They're not very friendly, are they? And, and we get offended. <clears throat> 
top of that, some of us are afraid of being open. You see, we know very well <laughs> the stuff about ourselves that's not perfect. We know the things that maybe we've just done last night or this morning that we're like, you know, I don't want anybody knowing that. I've shared with you that I have a couple of friends that uh, I've asked and we're sharing in accountability with one another. This week, something popped up in a video. I'm like, oh great, Wade's gonna see that and now he's gonna think bad of me. <laughs> and then I'm thinking, well, what if he goes and looks at it? Well, that's not good for him either. Maybe I should call him up. Wade, there was an accident. It was just on the screen there, it wasn't from me. You know, you see, when we're accountable to somebody else, and here's one of the challenges. Have you ever, I, I gotta tell you this one. This one's been hard for Debbie and I in ministry. We are the kind of people who try to get close to people. But because of that, people share. Sometimes they share their dark side, the side that they're ashamed of, the side that they're embarrassed of. You know what's troubled us is the number of people that after they've shared, not because of us, but because they think of it later, you know me. You know what I've done. And we're like, you know, don't even remember it. Forgot it completely. You, you, what did you do? <laughs> Remind me so I know what I'm supposed to be remembering. I mean, we're just, we're those kind of people. We can kind of just let it go. But the problem is, is that when somebody shares with you, they oftentimes like, oh, you just, you keep remembering that. Every time you see me, you're thinking that. No, <laughs> no farthest from my mind. It's like not even back there. You don't realize how bad of a memory I have. <laughs> Some of us are afraid to open up to other people. Oh, and we'll, we'll use excuses like, well, I was burned. I shared with somebody and they told someone else. And they told someone else and it you know, went all around. And, and yeah, there's gossips everywhere, right? And if you're a junior hire, oh my goodness. <laughs> you don't even have to have done it for a story to start up out there, okay? <clears throat> Some of you remember your junior high days. <laughs> So how is it then that we can encourage one another? Because when we come here, we want to look kind of nice, right? You want people to kind of think well of you. So you don't want them to know the, the sins that you've committed. And that's kind of why it's easier just to sit in a chair and look at people's backs. And for some of us, then we will get out of here quickly, especially if it got too close to home, because somebody might push the button and ask us, could you tell me how you really feel? And I, no. You see, we are challenged, aren't we, with opening up to each other. The fact is, is that some of that is because we know there's reasons why people shouldn't like us. <laughs> And, and we could share those things. But some of it is, is because it's a spiritual battle that God wants us to come alongside of each other, to sharpen one another, to help one another grow and become more like him. And from the beginning of time, when Adam and Eve fell, there's been a battle trying to keep us from a relationship with one another and a relationship with God. So let's look at our text again. Virgil read it already from, from Hebrews 10. And, and notice the, the depth of how this begins. It says, we have the privilege of entering the most holy place, the holy of holies. It's the next slide, I think. There, thanks Mike. We, it, it, this is an incredible privilege that God gives to us. In the tradition of Israel, once a year, one man selected individually with a rope tied around his ankle so that in case he died in the holy place, they could pull him out there and he didn't stay inside there because no one else could go in. One man went into the most holy place. It's the day of atonement, Yom Kippur, there to take the sins of the people to God. 
put an offering there in the center of the holy place once a year. Whoa! Once a year. Folks, how often can we go into the most holy place? Moment by moment. Why? Because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. It's in Christ alone and what he's done for us that we have the power to enter into the holy place. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that's paid the price, the ultimate and pure and complete sacrifice that's paid the way so that we can go into that holy place. It's there in the presence of God in that holy place that we get to lift up one another, that we get to share our hearts with God Almighty. It's there. I can actually be an encouragement to others because I can go into the presence of God in the most holy place. Folks, don't miss how incredible and amazing that privilege is. You, because of the blood of Jesus Christ, because of his body, get to walk into a room that was held separate for centuries. And think of this, if you're a Jew and not believing in the Messiah, you don't get to go there at all. And so what do you have to do? You send somebody to the wailing wall, the outside wall that's still left of the temple, and you'll do prayers there hoping that God will hear you. There is no entrance into the most holy place because it doesn't exist right now in Israel. There is no temple. And yet we are the temple of God is what scripture has told us because the Holy Spirit now, God himself dwells within us and we get to talk straight to God. Let's enter the holy place. Larry Crabb says, we must be equally quick to teach that with the atonement there is forgiveness. With forgiveness there is connection. With connection, there is the community of faith, a community destined to enter the bliss of perfect connect, connection forever. The point of the whole plan is relationship, a connected community. In verse 22, he says, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. What takes care of a guilty conscience? <laughs> forgiveness. Well, how do you get forgiveness? Confession. <laughs> Being open and honest about this is what I've just done. So when I look my guys in the eye and say, how'd you do? And when he's able to look back, and say, well, I did great. But when he looks back and says, Rather, you didn't ask that one, Bill. The confession that happens in that moment is something that can be freeing. Folks, have any of you been ashamed of your sin? Do you have a sin or sins that you would rather not stand up on a Sunday morning and share with all the rest of us? See, the, the, the beauty of Jesus is that he says, if, if you'll be honest about that, instead of trying to keep it hidden, the guilt will be removed. The shame will be taken away. And it's interesting. You need to ask yourself, are you more willing to share with God who is perfect and holy and just and has a right to destroy you with fire? Or with a human being who's just as dirty as you are. You might want to ask yourself, why am I more willing to share with that God than I am to be honest with another brother or sister who is on the way to cross and on the way to heaven just like me. It may have something to do with my lack of humility rather than too much humility. It may have something more to do with my pride, which I think is a sin, <laughs> than it has to do with the fact that, well, they're going to talk to somebody else and I can't trust them. Draw near to God. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. 
He invites us to come to him. You see, God's the one who's opened the door. He knows we couldn't get there without him doing it. So he's opened up the door and he says, come on in, come talk to me. He invites us to come into that holy, holy place and to fellowship with him and just to enjoy him. Hebrews goes on and it challenges us to encourage one another. In verse 24, it says, and let us consider how we may what? (laughs) When I stood in front of Junior, how we may provoke one another, how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. This word here for encourage one another is an interesting word. The present tense says that it's something that we should be doing daily and continually. It's that, it's that we should be encouraging one another every single day. Wait a second, but we only get together on Sundays. And then not all of us get together. And so it may be weeks till we see one another But he says we're supposed to be encouraging one another daily, even more so. If you think that Jesus is coming back soon, then you should be doing even more encouraging. The the word for encouraging is the word, the root word that we have for paraclete. Paraclete. Have you heard that word? The paraclete. That is the word for the Holy Spirit. Jesus uses it. I'm going to send a paraclete who is going to come alongside of you to bring you comfort, to give you peace. The paraclete is the one who is the (laughs) come-alongsider, who who challenges, encourages, exhorts, prods. Listen to those words there. He's the the one who serves us, who, who helps us. In the Septuagint, the paraclete has this background of being the kind of comfort and consolation and distress which keeps a man on his feet when he's in battle. You know what soldiers miss the most when they're out of the military? The camaraderie. The support. The strength. The paracletes. The encouragement of their fellow soldiers. And that's why it meant so much to those wounded warriors to be back together. Because they're fighting a new, well, a new battle. And it's to deal with the pain and the loss of life and so many things. And so they get back with their guys and they're fighting together again. <clears throat> the word paraclete has a background in Greek law. This is interesting. The paracletus was the prisoner's friend, the, the advocate and counsel for the defense, the man who bore witness to his friend's character when he most needed it, when others wished to condemn him. Therefore, when we describe the glorified Christ as our paracletus, we mean that he is there to speak for us before God. When everyone else is opposed to you, everyone else is against you, everyone else says, no, they're bad, they're terrible. The paracletus is the one who stood up and said, no, I believe in this man or this woman. Do you have somebody who can do that for you? Who knows you well enough to stand by your side, to help you be strong, to stand up for you in court and say, I can speak to the character of this man or woman. If somebody who knows you like that the, the Greek um, verb, the word parakalein or parakaleo, is the word for exhorting men to noble deeds and high thoughts. It's the word for courage in battle. It's what the coach says before they go out onto the field and he gives them that pep talk or that halftime conversation and says, here's how we're going to defeat them as we go back out there. It's the general or the, or the sergeant or the, or the comrade who says, come on, we're going to be strong in this together. I got your back because I know you've got mine. That's para Kalein. Life is always calling us into battle, one theologian said, and the one who makes us able to stand up to the opposing forces, to cope with life and to conquer life, is the parakletos, the Holy Spirit, who is none other than the presence and the power of the risen Jesus Christ. He's the paraclete. But what are we? We're supposed to be paracletes. We're supposed to come alongside and spur one another on. The word there is, is a word for incite one another. I used it already, provoke, or here's an interesting one, irritate. (laughs) 
Do you have anybody who kind of helping you to be a better person and they irritate you? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> um, that's why God's given us marriage. <laughs> That's why God's put us in family. Sometimes parents irritate their, their kids. Sometimes kids irritate their parents. <laughs> Sometimes husbands irritate their wives. <laughs> Sometimes wives irritate their husbands. Sometimes a brother or sister in Christ and irritates a brother or sister in Christ. And God has called us to actually do some of that. Now, not the kind of irritation that's meant to like mess them up, but notice the kind of thing that's going to provoke them. This is what a coach has to do, isn't it? That's going to provoke them to love and good deeds, the writer of Hebrews says. We need people around us that are going to stir us up and get us going for Jesus Christ and do the kinds of things that are going to show love to one another, love to a community, and do good deeds out there. We need to be prodded, folks, frankly, because for some of us, it's easier just to sit and not take action <laughs> or come up with all the excuses as to why we don't. And God himself has sent his Holy Spirit, and notice, as a paraclete, as one who comes alongside and pushes, who gets close, to, close enough to us to know us and challenges us to become like Jesus. <clears throat> Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12, it says, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another, paraclete one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, when he was in prison, having been put there because he was trying to get rid of Adolf Hitler, he and some others had plotted against him and Hitler found out. And so this, he's in prison and he's writing and he writes this amazing book about togetherness and being the body. He says, the physical presence of other Christians is a source of incomparable joy and strength to the believer. Is that true for you? The presence of other believers, does it give you joy and strength? Or are you a stranger? Folks, this is not about attending worship, really. When he says, some of them are not meeting together. Did you catch that one? And a, and a lot of pastors will use that as, you know, see, this is why you got to be at church every single Sunday. And you know, okay, I think there's value in being here, being in the word, worshiping God, lifting God up every single week. I think we need that. I think we need that literally one day a week where we're spending some time just to focus on God and it's refreshing and it's an encouragement to us and it's a blessing to us. But folks, that's not what the early church was doing. They didn't have the big Sunday gatherings. What did they do? Well, read Acts chapter 2, and you'll see that they met in homes daily. They broke bread together. They studied the apostles' teaching together. They worked at applying the word of God together. As they broke that bread, they literally ate together. They were, they were community they prayed for one another with understanding and knowledge, not just, you know, okay, God bless them. But they knew details because they were living together daily. And what happened also? God added to their number daily. Why? Because they were in community. Don't let your home be an excuse for you not getting together with other people. How many of you never eat at home? Please raise your hands. Never eat at home. Good. 
if it's good enough for you to eat there, it's good enough for you to invite someone else to eat there too. I'm serious. Look at this. He says that we need to spur one another on by what? By being in community daily together. And one of those things, the, one of those ways we do that is literally by eating together. Haven't you ever noticed that when you sit and you eat with somebody, you converse a lot better than when you move away from the table and then sit in the open room? Conversation always changes. Because when you're at table, you're kind of like this. <laughs> or, the way guys like it, you're like this. Side by side. You see, at, at table, at a meal, you have something kind of just keep you going when conversation gets quiet. <laughs> but that conversation at table is where community is developing. And God is calling us and he's saying, look, spur one another on. Get to know one another. Spend some time eating together. Breaking bread together. Talking about how you're applying the word of God together. Some of you know that, you know, what I'm describing is what happens in life groups. And you're saying, oh, yeah, okay, another life group message. Really? This is not about life groups. It's not about cells. It's not about small groups. This is about a calling that God has given to us to be the body of Christ. And without community, we cannot be that body. And the fact is, is that as we get closer to one another, there's going to be things we're not going to like. We talk about that in small groups. You actually reach a point in time where you actually kind of um, have some conflict because you're getting to know each other too well. That never happens with spouses, right? Or parents and kids. And you, know, you, you don't know each other so well that you get in trouble with each other, right? But we got to work through those things. You see, it's about working through life that draws us closer, helps us to become more like Jesus Christ. In a letter to the editor of a British newspaper, a man complained that he saw no sense in going to church every Sunday. Man, we're in a culture that says that, right? I don't need religion. I can worship Jesus alone. Sometime, the next time somebody says that to you, I can worship Jesus alone? Number one, ask them, so how do you worship him? Tell me about it. And number two, ask them, so how do you take care of the other piece of loving your neighbor as yourself? Well, anyways, back to the, the illustration. He writes to this British newspaper, he says, I have been attending services quite regularly for the past 30 years. And during that time, I have listened to no less than 3,000 sermons. But to my consternation, I discover I cannot remember a single one of them. I can't either, frankly. <laughs> I have the distinct impression, whoops, I wonder if a minister's time might be more profitably spent on something else. The letter sparked many responses. One, however, may have been the clincher. I have been married for 30 years. During that time, I have eaten 32,850 meals, mostly of my wife's cooking. Suddenly, I have discovered that I cannot remember the menu of a single meal. And yet, I received nourishment from every one of them. I have the distinct impression that without them, I would have starved to death long ago. <laughs> there was the pastor who goes over to, to see this man who had not been attending church. He sits down. It's winter time, and kind of like up here, uh, they had a fireplace sits down and he says, you know, just greeting him and talking to him and talking about the fact that he doesn't get to see him. And the pastor reaches in to the fireplace with the, uh, the stove, shovel or whatever was there and there's a bright, bright, just a really hot piece of wood that's on fire and he pulls a piece of it away from the fire. He just sits there and watches and away from the rest of the fire the, the, the glow, the fire on that little piece of wood starts to go out. 
And the pastor got up and left. Next week, the man was in worship. Why? Because the illustration was, was so strong. Oh yeah, we, we, we get prideful. We think we can make it. We think we don't need anybody else. No one else will understand. Nobody else relates to me. Nobody else can communicate well with me. I don't have time. I got so much other things happening. Besides, I don't know if I really want to trust anybody with what's going on in my heart. And in the process, we are growing cold for Jesus Christ. And God is challenging us. Spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Are you an encourager? Are you a kind of person who comes alongside of others and encourages them? I mean, I started to mention this earlier and stepped away from it, but that's what a coach does. The really good coaches, have any of you guys watched um, Pete, what's his name up there at uh, Seattle? Thank you. All of a sudden went blank. <laughs> See, I told you I don't remember sin. <laughs> yeah, Pete Carroll's an interesting coach. And um, Philip had the privilege of being on his team for a year at USC. And what you see on the sidelines on TV is real. The guy has fun. The guy's an encourager. The guy comes along, he, he, he literally does love his players. He gets close to them, gets next to them, and he simply enjoys the game. And who knows, maybe Seattle will win another world championship. I didn't say I was rooting for him. <laughs> Watch out if they do. <laughs> but here's the thing. What Pete Carroll understands is the value of getting next to his people. He opens himself up. He's vulnerable to them. He's a friend to them. But he also knows how to say, hey, don't do that. Hey, get back out on that field and you work for it right now. You just threw an interception, go out there and throw a touchdown. You missed that tackle? I know you can do it, so don't take your eye off him this next time. Do your job. He knows how to challenge a person and sometimes people don't like it. When somebody points out the thing you're doing wrong, we like to hide and run and we get really embarrassed. We're in the middle of a meeting and the whole team's there and saying, you blew your assignment. Take a look here. <laughs> Cornerback, you blew your assignment. And because of that, the touch, they, they scored the touchdown. Now, take note and let's make sure we don't do that again. And he'll show and guide and train and practice. You see, that's what good coaches do. Guess what, folks? We are called to be coaches of one another. How can I coach you if I don't know you? There's a reason why mega churches are doing well. Because we don't want to be coached. We don't want to do it individually on our own by ourselves. And God is calling us to community, not separation. Are you an encourager? Have you put yourself in a place to be present with somebody else who's hurting? Are you willing to risk having somebody accuse you of being judgmental? Do you care enough to attempt to keep someone from getting into sin? Will you help another person recognize the lies of their own sin? Encouragers come alongside in love and they speak the truth because they care. Are you an encourager? And I guess the other question that goes kind of along, right along with that is, who knows you? Who knows you well enough to be your encourager? Who knows you well enough to encourage you when you're struggling with the battle of sin? Who knows you well enough to challenge you to keep sharing Christ with someone who, who does not know him? Who knows you well enough and knows your burdens well enough to help you carry them? who carries your burdens with you and thus fulfills the law of Christ. Guess what, folks? Bottom line is, to do it, it takes time. Together. 
honesty, openness. Are you familiar with the one another's in scripture? Let me just read a few of them for you. Love one another. <laughs> okay, when you look at the one another's, love one another starts off and there's like five times in John that Jesus says, love one another, love one another, love one another, love one another. I think his point was we are supposed to what? Thank you. Love one another. Now, that all then gets described with a whole bunch of other one another's. In Romans 12, he says, be devoted to one another. Same verse, Romans 12, 10, honor one another above yourselves. Romans 15, accept one another just as Christ accepted you. Romans 15, 14, instruct one another. Or here's a stronger word, admonish one another. Whoa, no, I don't want any of that. I don't really like it when somebody admonishes me and tells me I'm doing something wrong. Oh, bummer, because I know I'm doing stuff wrong. But don't we need it? Well, guess what? He said, that's a command. Admonish one another. In the same sentence where he's saying instruct one another. In the same chapter where he's saying accept one another. He goes on and he says, serve one another in love. Forgive one another, Ephesians 4.32. Sub be kind to one another, or same verse. Ephesians 5.21, submit to one another. The, another word for that is respect one another. Galatians 6.2, carry one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. He goes on, build one another up, 1 Thessalonians 5.11. Spur one another on toward love and good deeds, our text this morning. Encourage one another. Confess your sins one to another. Pray for one another. Offer hospitality to one another. Oh, by the way, without grumbling. <laughs> and then he comes back. And John keeps saying it in 1 John. Love one another. 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 That was 1 John 3.11, 3.23, 4.7, 4.11, 4.12. And verse 5 of 2 John. How are you doing at the one another's? Are you an encourager and who knows you? Because in order to do the one another's, we need to spend time together. Why do I wear a name tag on Sunday morning? Because the, the bulletin says my name, right? So anyone who can, can surely figure it out, oh, okay, he's doing all the talking, he must be pastor. <laughs> because my responsibility is to try to help connect with other people. If I'm not going to share with you my name, I'm probably not going to share much else, am I? We have been called to challenge, encourage, to strengthen, to provoke, to stir up, to irritate one another to love and good deeds. Now, by the way, I am not asking you to, for everyone here to share everything with Pastor Bill. That becomes like cultish, doesn't it? You all got to be under my hand and do whatever I tell you. No, no, that's not what this is about. This is about the community of us to one another about us having somebody else that we're encouraging and being encouraged by. There's somebody stronger than us. There's somebody weaker than us. There's somebody closer to Christ and somebody farther to Christ. And God's calling us into that community to care for, to take care of, to encourage one another. And don't forget that the most important, most valuable thing we can do is what? What the text started with this morning. Wow. Wow we get to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus Christ, through the body of Christ. We get to come into the most holy place and speak to the creator of the universe, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the one who loves us so much he died on that cross, rose from the dead, and he's there ready to listen to us. We get to go in there. And when you go in there, don't be selfish. <laughs> when you go in there, Remember you're there to take somebody else and their needs as well. And when you leave there, you're supposed to go take what he has given you and to share it with someone else. Jesus, we need to be your body. And Lord, we, we err, we blow it lots of times. 
Sometimes we care too much and like that parent, we upset our child, especially if they're a teenager, with instructions and counsel and sometimes we just got to sit back and let them make a mistake and love them even when they do. So Lord, I pray for that kind of wisdom for us to learn how to encourage each other. God, I pray that we would take steps here. There are many of us that are not connected really to hardly anyone else in your body. Help us, Lord, to take steps to be more open, to receive and to give encouragement. Thank you, Lord, for the relationships you've given to us. Thank you, Lord, for our, our life groups and the privilege we have of caring for each other there. Uh, thank you just for the time we shared this last Friday night in our life group. A special time in your word, that special time to, to, to laugh with each other, to encourage each other, to challenge each other. And God, I pray for a lot more of that. Because a world out there is waiting to see the love that you want us to have for each other. They're waiting for the encouragement that comes and can only come through the body of Christ. So Jesus, if we don't know you today, I pray for any person right now who's never been able to say yes to you, who maybe even come to church for decades, but has never truly said yes to you in their heart. I pray, God, in this moment right now, that they'd stop, realize, yes, it's a fact. You died on the cross. You are the Son of God. You are the Lord, and you died for them. They'll accept your payment, what you did by dying, as forgiveness for them. And they'll commit themselves to saying, yes, God, I want to follow you the rest of my life. And all of us need to renew that commitment again today, God. We need to follow your word and be encouragers of others. For in Christ... In Christ alone is our hope of glory. In Christ alone is life. In Christ we are privileged to come to the most holy place. And in Christ we have life and blessing to give to a world that needs it. In Christ alone.